The problem is that the biopsy is often a requirement to prove you have prostate cancer. When you have an MRI, you have a PSA, you have abundant clinical evidence that the cancer is there, sticking a needle in there does nothing except a risk metastatic spread. What stops that from happening? It's your own immune system, guys. It's your immune system. So you got to keep it strong. You have to be proactive. You can't let yourself corrode. Wouldn't it be nice if you could target the spot where cancer occurs and just zap it out? Kind of like a skin cancer. But there is an analogy here, folks. I'm talking now about focal therapy for prostate cancer. That means targeting a section or the gland itself without surgery, without radiation. Is it worth considering? Does it work? Does it live up to the billing? Here's the problem. There's not a single focal therapy that has been proven to prevent you from dying of prostate cancer. Now that seems like a pretty fundamental question to be answered, but it's not easy. It takes 10 years, maybe longer. Prostate cancer moves slowly. Therefore, any study that proclaims success by virtue of saying, hey, in five years, we had a great survival rate, is very useless in my view because so many men are going to survive five years. In addition, most of these studies are done with early stage prostate cancer, which is oftentimes a misinterpretation. Early stage prostate cancer is often simply atypical dormant cells. Now they need to be respected because they can be dormant, meaning they're asleep, like Godzilla. But we all know what happens when he wakes up. Godzilla wakes up and Tokyo goes downhill. We're Tokyo, Godzilla's a cancer cells. Keep it sleeping. How do you keep it sleeping? Well, y'all remember Godzilla. I think they set off bombs and woke him up. The equivalent of the bomb that wakes up your dormant cells is the biopsy. Well, let's talk about some specific focal therapies. Now, all these focal therapies are based upon what is called the index lesion theory of prostate cancer, which means there's a spot where the cancer begins and then it grows. Simplistic and simply not true. The theory supports the propagation of this psychologically comfortable, but an effective treatment in my view, that we could target the lesion in quotes and get rid of it. Look, even in skin cancer, every nodule of cancer has tentacles that can't be seen with the naked eye. They extend out and that's why they cut out large areas and that's why if you've ever had surgery for skin cancer, there's a procedure called the Mohs procedure, M-O-H apostrophe S, where they carve it out like peeling an onion, looking at the layers to make sure they got all the cancer. You can't tell that by the naked eye. So let's go back to this focal theory, this identifiable lesion. They will convince you that an MRI can identify the exact spot to be targeted. That's just silly. We know that prostate cancer is a cellular phenomenon and it spreads throughout the gland through these little fibrils and cells and you can't target it. It's everywhere and it's undeniably either in that gland or outside of it. We have evidence that can help support. Is it inside or outside? So are focal therapies worth doing? There's a relatively new one, FDA cleared in 2019. And when you hear that term FDA cleared, it means a piece of medical equipment has been determined by the Food and Drug Administration to be safe and effective for its intended purpose. The intended purpose of the Tulsa equipment, transurethral ultrasound ablation, Tulsa. Somehow they got that acronym out of it. Is a procedure where they use ultrasound to heat the prostate and destroy the cells. The device is placed through the urethra. The heat via the ultrasound emanates outward. They can control it with an MRI, trying to make sure that they're not burning stuff that shouldn't be burned. It sounds good. 
And one of the reasons that these focal therapies sound so good is because conventional therapy is awful and it doesn't work. It does not prevent you from dying of prostate cancer. When they talk about curing the disease, that's a bold-faced exaggeration. They really shouldn't be able to say that any more than I can say that about my protocol. Now, my protocol has not been proven to cure the disease, but it's not going to hurt you. And there's evidence of benefit behind the drugs and the supplements that are used. So in my view, if you have prostate cancer or a high risk thereof, number one, do not get a biopsy. And if you have, don't shed a tear, just don't get any more, right? You can go back to my uh, earlier podcast on that, but the essence of it is that a biopsy isn't going to help us make decisions when we've already ruled out prostatectomy, we've ruled out radiation because they're awful, at least you should rule them out, that leaves you with what? A biopsy to prove what you can otherwise discover through an MRI and monitoring the PSA over time. That's what we want to know. Are things changing? Is this getting worse? Is the risk increasing? So these focal therapies have the comfort of not being as destructive. Okay, that's a good thing. So in that sense, I can't be completely dismissive. I understand why they have an appeal, and they may turn out to be worth considering. But here's some problems. The Tulsa procedure, the trial, one of the primary studies that helped get it through FDA clearance, looked at 115 men for 12 months. So right away, I have a problem. 115 men is not enough, and 12 months is not long enough. So, all right, let's go with it, see what information they gathered. What they discovered was that it was effective at diminishing the prostate size and lowering the PSA. All right, I suppose those are good things. But far too much emphasis is placed upon chasing a number, the PSA, and way too little emphasis is placed upon preventing the disease from spreading. And those are two separate phenomena. They roughly correlate, but it's not inevitable. A high PSA does not mean that you have prostate cancer. We'll talk about more in a moment. Let's go back to the study. What happened? So the Tulsa procedure was done. The men had an ablative therapy performed. By the way, all the men had either mild or moderate risk disease. These are not men with really ominous looking disease. And the prostate glands were relatively small. Well, that makes sense. If you're going through the urethra and you're heating it with ultrasound, you can't have a gigantic prostate. The heat wouldn't reach the outer perimeter of it as effectively. So in this study, 12 months later, 35% of the men still had cancer. At least 65% didn't have evidence of it, but 35% did. That's not really a high level of success if you're going through an expensive, potentially hazardous procedure. Yes, oftentimes this is not insurance covered. 25% of the men had erectile difficulty after the procedure. So it's not benign. Is it less traumatic than a prostatectomy? Yes. Is it less traumatic than radiation? It is. But is it worth doing? Those are separate questions. In this study, they did not compare it to a placebo. Well, that's unethical. I don't think it's right to take a man, tell him he has prostate cancer or a high likelihood of it, and just say, good luck with this. We're just going to kind of sit around and do nothing. That's what they call uh, active monitoring or watchful waiting. It sounds comforting, but in essence, no treatment is rendered. You're left to your own devices. And that's why so many of you guys get stuck on the Internet, sucking on ivermectin at toxic doses. I like it in its place, but it's simplistic when you start to go down that path. And I can't blame you because there are a few other alternatives. So here we are, the ablative therapy looks good. Well, here was their conclusion. I'm going to quote from the conclusion. Now, listen carefully to what is not said. Quote, effective tissue ablation and low rates of toxicity and residual disease. That's how they summarize the treatment. Effective tissue ablation. Big deal. I don't want to just ablate tissue. I want to not have cancer spread. And low rates of toxicity and residual disease. I don't consider a 35% residual to be a low rate. 
I want something better than that. If you're going to stick a wand up my urethra and heat my prostate with a 25% chance of losing erectile vitality, I want a better outcome. Now, that's my perspective. Should you consider this? I'm still open-minded toward it. I will say this, and I'm looking for urologists that would be willing to do this. If they would be willing to do it without a biopsy, it may have a niche. The problem is that the biopsy is often a requirement to prove you have prostate cancer. When you have an MRI, you have a PSA, you have abundant clinical evidence that the cancer is there, sticking a needle in there does nothing except a risk metastatic spread. So if that could be done, maybe a consideration in conjunction with addressing it systemically. The problem, you can't tell when that cancer leaves the gland because it does so at a cellular level, like dandelion seeds spreading over the lawn, right? One day you look out and there's the lawn covered in dandelions and you go, what happened? Yesterday they weren't there because those little cells can spread. And they can seed themselves in the skeleton, in the liver, in places where they all bloom at once. What stops that from happening? It's your own immune system, guys. It's your immune system. So you got to keep it strong. You have to be proactive. You can't let yourself corrode, right? So should you get a Tulsa procedure? It's a consideration. But would they do it without a biopsy? And does it complement the protocol I've developed? It may. It may, but I like the protocol as a standalone. I want to see future studies done with my protocol as the control group. And I want to see what the difference would be. We're in the process of gathering that data from our group, but how cool would it be if they would compare them? Well, how about another blade? If I got time for another one, HIFU, high intensity ultrasound therapy done usually transperitoneal in order to try to ablate the prostate. It's another one of these heating mechanisms. Problem. One year after a procedure, this is a study published in 2023, 29 patients. You'll notice once again, relatively small numbers. One year later, 44.8% still had cancer and 30% had erectile difficulty. Only 3%, however, were leaking urine. So it's got that going for it. Less urinary leakage. Should you get a high foo? Should you get these local therapies? I'm not an advocate of them. They're expensive, not proven to work. I think that they're a consideration in the right time and place, but that right time and place may well be only after you've tried other things like the protocol that I've developed. So be careful about being lured into that which sounds comforting. A sense of false comfort can happen. They're expensive. If you're going to get this done, take your time, get multiple opinions. I wouldn't say never. Ultimately, man, this is your choice. You all have to decide. But do not do some of these procedures until you've had comparative assessments from other urologists. Consider all your options side by side. One of the problems with these procedures is once they're released by the FDA, they can disseminate widely and they tend to be utilized a lot more aggressively in part because of the reimbursement dynamics. Simply put, dude invests a lot of money in this equipment, wants to then put it to work. So those nicely refined protocols, yeah, they kind of get blown up. Well, the index lesion theory, I think is a comfortable myth that I don't believe is actually at play. What we have is a cellular theory. So what we need, systemic treatments. Well, that's all I got for today, gang. Thanks for spending some time with me. Consider your options. Take your time. Be thoughtful. Continue to watch the podcast. And I invite you into the community as well. That's the Prostate Protocol community where you can get more expanded information and contact. All right, we'll talk to you next time. Bye.